to start as quickly as possible because we have a, a session, yes, um, that is, has a fair number of speakers and two hours. And I'm limiting our speakers by uh, to 12, 13 minutes maximum. Uh, and I don't want anybody to be cut out, so I'll be fairly uh, stiff about that. And our first speaker was going to be Jack Goldstone, and he seems to be uh, late. He was delayed by a meeting uh, with the rector. Um, so let me just begin by making a few remarks now. As you all know, uh, the differences between countries are often not as great as the disparities within them. We're learning more about the exact numbers uh, of, of those figures by a great number of the participants here who contributed on Russia and China and Bronco on global uh, forces. And he, he, he says, correct me if I'm wrong, but in his book on, uh, in 2012, based on the Gini coefficient, he shows that global inequality may be about the same as in the 1980s, but we know that regional inequality is wide and with the current downturn likely to get uh, much wider um, and so we have decided to approach this panel uh, by, uh, my name is Carol Leonard, by way of introduction. I'm, I'm at Ranyapa, and I'm, co I'm uh, co-moderating this with Ivan Lyubimo from the Gaidar Institute, who will be handling the, uh, the Russian speakers. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, we have decided to invite this, divide this by talking about general global and then devoting the remainder of the session to specifically features of uh, in inequality in Russia and Russia's regions. Um, and we have the foremost speakers, um, of course, one of the experts um, here. I'm very, quite excited about this. May I introduce, as a first speaker, um, uh, not by program, but um, by choice, Avner. Okay, Avner Offer, who was the former Chichely Professor of Economic History at the University of Oxford and now Emeritus Fellow at All Souls College. He's a Fellow of the British Academy of Social Sciences. No, no, okay. the Academy, the full Academy. The full Academy. Can I say what you <laughs> <laughs> He has written many books. Most recently, he has written a book called Social Democracy, the Nobel Prize in Economics and the Market Turn. But more germane to our, our present uh, topics of conversation, experts <laughs> on urban and rural land tenure, finance, uh, consumption and well-being, two magnificent um, works between the gift and the market, the economy of regard, and the challenge of affluence, a book published in 2006 at Oxford, self-control and well-being in the United States and Britain since 1950. Avner. Uh, thank you very much. Is this working? Uh, well, you all know about uh, Piketty, who's published this great book on inequality. And Piketty reduces inequality to a very simple <coughs> formula, uh, an inequality in which R is greater than G. R is the financial rate of interest, and G is the rate of growth in the economy. If the rate of interest persists being higher than the, great, the rate of growth in the economy, then you have a transfer from the general population to the people who own financial assets. And that, according to Piketty, to simplify things, uh, sorry? Uh, well, the question is, is it true? Uh, that accounts for the high level of inequality in Western societies. Wow. And there's a graph that has become very famous, uh, which shows the course of uh, the share of the top 1% in the, uh, this is the English speaking countries. Uh, he has it over 200 years, I've cut it to 100 years. And you can see that Piketty is wrong 70% of the time. <laughs> uh, now, if it wasn't for the last 40 years, he would be wrong all the time. <laughs> So the question is, what happened in the last 40 years? And that's what I want to focus on. <clears throat> and I have two stories to tell. One story is money, and the other story is housing. Uh, so first, the money story. Uh, up to the 1970s, we've had financial repression. We had credit was regulated. Banks couldn't lend as much as uh, they might have wanted to. Uh, the main constraint was actually the exchange rate, maintaining a fixed exchange rate. Uh, but that went around 1970, 
So Bretton Woods, the gold standard, that was thrown away. And from the 1970s, we've had floating exchange rates. What justified this was a faith in markets, the idea that markets could bring things into a benign equilibrium. <clears throat> and so credit was deregulated. Uh, essentially, banks were told to lend as much as they thought was proper. Now, where do the banks get their money? Uh, where does money come from? Uh, despite economics being around for about 250 years now, this simple question has not been settled yet. Uh, but I can tell you that <laughs> I can tell you that the banks don't need depositors in order to lend. Yes, they don't need to take money from depositors and lend it to the borrowers. Uh, money is originated by the commercial banks. <coughs> Sorry. Money is originated by the commercial banks. It does not require the intermediation or prior deposit. And the evidence for this is how the balance sheets, the loans, the assets of the banks have increased tenfold as a percentage of GDP in the last 40 years. Now, there wasn't enough money to deposit to make it possible to increase the balance sheets uh, by, uh, on this scale. And then there's no other plausible source of liquidity uh, for such an increase in deposits. So banks create money by lending it. Uh, this is a housing story. The housing story is that money is not easy to lend, uh, especially since deindustrialization begins in uh, Europe, the United States, in the 1970s. And so there's a shortage of productive investments. There's also uh, one aspect of, uh, thank you. You're on the edge, not the edge. Okay. <laughs> one aspect of deindustrializations is uh, the large financial imbalances that form between the uh, importers, exporters, and those surpluses also have to be recycled. So that increases the pressure to lend. So who do we lend to? Well, it turns out that housing is the ideal asset. Uh, first, it has a built-in collateral. You know, you have the building there. Uh, the demand happens to be insatiable. People demand as much housing as they have income. Uh, so it rises with income. Also, you can't, uh, you can't get out of this. Everyone needs to be housed somewhere. It's both a subsistence good, but it's also a status good. Uh, it's also the largest consumer expenditure. So it's a very big thing, very nice thing to lend against. Uh, house prices are driven by credit. Uh, the credit is used by households to bid the prices up. They compete against each other. And this is a competition that nobody can avoid. Uh, and this pays off. It pays off because borrowing pays off because wealth grows faster than debt. Uh, the reason, one reason it grows faster than debt is house prices also affect the value of housing you've paid off already. It goes up together with the prices that people pay uh, for their housing. So what we have in this post 1970s world is something I call the housing windfall economy. Everyone seems to benefit from it. Uh, two thirds of the population are owner occupiers. So that's a privileged majority of people are playing this game. Uh, and also it has considerable social and political support from the wealthy. Uh, another reason why this is so, such a good deal is that it has a lot of tax relief. It's an investment that you don't have to pay income tax on. Uh, you don't have to pay capital gains tax. In many countries, you don't have to pay tax uh, on interest. Uh, so it enjoys particular privilege from taxation. The money released from taxation is available to bid the prices even higher. Uh, so, but this windfall economy needs credit to continue. It cannot stop. It needs to go on expanding. Uh, now, this graph shows 
that household debt rises much faster than income, uh, 1918, 1995, 2000, uh, you don't want to look at the overall graph, but at what happens within countries. And the one point I would make is that household debt increases much, much faster than income in pretty much every country, except I think in Japan. Uh, now, what does this debt buy people? Uh, what I want to show here is that wealth grows faster than debt. So, First, this is, uh, this is all measured as percentage of GDP, household <coughs> wealth or assets as percentage of GDP. This is the household debt below the red line. Now, this is financial assets. It's called household financial assets. But what it really is, is the balancing item. Yes, this is the loans that support the debt. And they're all owned by a very small percentage, very small fraction of households. So we can ignore this as a household asset. Then we have the pension funds, which is the yellow stuff here. So the thing to look at is housing debt. And I think you'll see that in most countries, not housing debt, housing asset, yeah. Housing assets, you'll see that in most countries, uh, housing wealth considerably exceeds housing debt. So it's a very good deal for the people who are playing this game. Uh, but there is a price to be paid. The price to be paid is inequality and instability. So debt service takes a rising share of labor income, and that means that the labor share of income is declining. The share of capital is increasing, share of labor is decreasing. Uh, young people, low earners, are unable to get on this ladder. They have to pay very high rents, housing shortage, inequality, social crisis, there's a lost generation of younger people who cannot actually uh, get on this ladder uh, and even find it difficult to afford housing in general. The intermediaries, the financial institutions, take a very big cut. Uh, the money that goes into debt service is not available for consumption of goods and services, and that effectively or eventually contracts the economy. There's a transfer from spenders to hoarders, from public goods to rentiers. Uh, it depresses demand, economic activity in public services uh, until there comes a point where the borrowers are unable to service the loans, and then we have a financial crisis. That's pretty much the story we've had. Uh, in addition to that, when the construction stops, People who work in construction are laid off. Uh, so uh, the people who borrowed money against the value of their house to buy stuff can't do that. Um, and then what happens? The creditors are bailed out by the taxpayers. How do, is this done? This is done by means of austerity. So the population is squeezed once again. And, you know, I have something on quantitative easing, but I won't go into this. Uh, so what we have as the end target of this cycle is economic stagnation, no recovery, slow recovery. If that looks familiar, then that's where it comes from. And I want to show you what this graph shows is debt service ratios and crisis dates. So you see these graphs show this is a percentage of GDP. Uh, how much of GDP is spent on debt service? And you can see that when it peaks, we have a financial crisis. Uh, the danger zone is around 25, 28%. Uh, in the meantime, despite the economic depression, recession, stagnation, whatever you want to call it, debt continues to increase. It's 2000, 2007, 2014. If you look at the bottom line, uh, debt continues to increase as percentage, this case of global GDP. So what should we do about this? Uh, well, we are not going to do anything. What should they do about this? Uh, <laughs> well, just now, Piketty is right. So just now, since 1980s, R has been greater than G. The rich have been becoming richer. 
uh, financial return is higher than economic growth. This is an unstable equilibrium which drives rising inequality and is heading for a crash. You heard it here first. It's heading, <laughs> it's heading for a crash. <coughs> uh, now, I've just spoken about the, life, the uh, housing part of the debt story, but this has been extended to the rest of the life cycle. So now we also borrow to pay for education and we borrow to pay for pensions as well. So the rentiers are now uh, sinking their claws into the whole of the life cycle. Uh, okay, so what about policy? It seems to me, and not only to me, some other people are advocating this, that, uh, this is the last slide, uh, that uh, the policy principle is that private credit needs to be regulated and probably needs to be subject to quantitative controls. Uh, restricting credit growth as much as possible to the productive economy, and that would be both efficient and equitable. But it won't solve the existing debt overhang. You know, we, you saw this enormous debt overhang uh, that hangs over all of us. What to do about that? Uh, well, there are various drastic proposals around, like inflation or write-offs or even the government printing money. Uh, the choice, it seems to me, is between drastic action now or a drastic crisis later. Uh, and current policy now seems to prefer a drastic crisis later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This session is supposed to be about economic growth being positive, but in this model, there is no economic growth. That model depends on a static stock of housing. Indeed. <laughs> there's no growth there. Well, there hasn't been any growth for the last eight years. Zero yes, growth. yes, yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Walter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I'm leaving this here. Uh, shall we save questions till later? We don't really have too much time, um, but we got one there. Uh, can I introduce Jeff Goldstone, please? Uh, he's the founding director of the Institute for Public Policy in Hong Kong at the University of Science and Technology, uh, formerly head of a research project here at Ron Yapa, we consider him sort of ours. Um, Elman Family Professor of Public Policy. Turn it on with the help, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's the director of um, Institute for Public Policy, which he's creating in Hong Kong at the University of Science and Technology and uh, formerly research, director of a research project at Ranyapa on political demography, um, which, which is completed and still ongoing, as I understand it, however, without him. Uh, he has studied long-term patterns of social change from a variety of disciplines, economic history, sociology, political science, and has written um, many books, including Political Demography, How Population Changes Are Reshaping International Security and National Politics, Oxford, 2012. Thank you. All right, I'm not going to talk about the causes of inequality. I think you're getting that from the other members of the panel. Instead, I'm going to um, shift focus to what are some of the political consequences we can anticipate from these broad trends. The, the two big trends in global inequality are that inequality between nations is diminishing, right? As the emerging countries grow richer, the gap between the developed world and the emerging market countries is shrinking. But at the same time, over the last 40 years, inequality within countries, both developed and emerging, has been sharply increasing. So that the, the middle classes are growing in the emerging markets, but the rich are growing even faster, China having more billionaires now than the United States. Um, even in Africa, the middle class is pulling away rapidly uh, from the poor. Uh, the good news is there are fewer poor, but the middle class are uh, advancing away from the rest. So we're seeing these two opposite trends. What will they mean for politics? A lot of people are concerned about the rising inequality within nations as a threat to social stability. Why don't the rest of us rise up against the 1% that are using this financial leverage to get uh, much richer than the rest of us? Well, we probably won't. 
I, I have to say, I don't think the rising inequality within nations will become a major political problem. And that's simply because historically, it rarely has. If we look at the countries in the Middle East and North Africa that suffered revolutionary breakdowns in 2011, they did not have remarkably high inequality. Uh, countries like Tunisia and Egypt had less income inequality than countries like Brazil or other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. It's not the absolute level of inequality or poverty that motivates people to take the very risky and dangerous action of mobilizing to change their government. That kind of action only comes from a deep conviction that the existing system is unfair, fraudulent, unjust, being operated by people in their interests at the expense of everyone else. Now, a lot of people try and make the case that financial elites are uh, operating to their benefit at the expense of others. But it's a harder case to make than situations where there is a small, easily identified corrupt group around a closed government, or when there are particular ethnic groups or religious groups that seem to dominate the economy. If you have what is by and large a market economy, the fact that some people are doing much better in that market than others tends to be accepted by everyone. As long as fortunes are made according to some set of rules, people say, well, maybe I'll be able to do that someday myself. And indeed, in the housing market, many people shared the gains that made the extreme financial gains at the top possible. What the ultra-rich have done throughout history is to tell the middle classes that their future would be threatened by redistributive actions that take money and give it to the poorest section of society. And so as long as the middle class feels that they can get by, they tend to resist redistribution because they feel they will bear the brunt of it. It is only when you get a crisis on the order of the Great Depression, that is with unemployment rising to around 25%, that you can get a mass movement to really agitate for change in the political system. <laughs> so while there, I think there may indeed be such a crash and a crisis at some point, as Avner predicts, until we get to that point, I think people will continue to accept the rising levels of inequality we have. Indeed, if anything, you'll see more mobilization, as we've seen, on the right, from the Tea Party, from nationalist parties, from anti-immigrant parties. You will see outsiders and the poor being blamed for social ills rather than the very rich. So that's what I see within society. However, the global shift with emerging market countries growing is going to have a different and more immediate set of implications. The most obvious is the rise of China. China, although middle income, is now the second largest economy in the world, and China wants a place at all the global tables where they will be equal with Europe and the US in charting the future. In fact, they're very excited that they're going to be hosting the G20 meetings this year. And indeed, China will accept nothing less than recognition of its international status as a major power. Uh, this, of course, is risky. Uh, it involves them, in some cases, making aggressive moves uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, but I do think it is a reality that China's economy has emerged, and that it's in the interest of all countries to try and rebalance global institutions to accommodate, in a peaceful way, the rise of China. If we don't do that, China will continue to develop its own cluster of international institutions, as it is seeking to do, um, in order to challenge the dominant uh, Western World Bank IMF complex. Now, while this is um, promising for China, it leaves countries like Russia in something of a dilemma. So Russia had been one of the club of relatively wealthy developed countries in Europe and North America at a time when Asian, African, Middle Eastern, South American countries were really much poorer than the West. Uh, so all through 19th, early 20th century, there was no question uh, that Russia was a major power. The main challenge came from Japan, which made a kind of sudden 
leap in the 19th century uh, to join the other developed powers, was the first non-Western country to do so. Uh, but today, Russia is facing a world in which emerging economies, such as Brazil, as well as China, have overtaken it in size. So Brazil today has a much larger economy. Within a few years, India will have a larger economy. Uh, in fact, so India's economy is already, by most uh, accounts, larger than that of Russia. Um, so Russia finds itself in the situation where it is surrounded increasingly by emerging market economies that are either surpassing it or catching up, whether it's China or India or even Turkey which has run into problems recently, but if Turkey continues its growth in population and income, it too will start to catch up to Russia. And indeed, in terms of population, by mid-century, there may be half a dozen countries in Africa with larger populations than Russia. So a number of countries in Europe were superpowers in their own right prior to World War I. Great Britain, most obviously, with a global empire, France with aspirations to global empire as well. Germany seeking to sustain itself as a continental superpower. But over the course of the 20th century, first the Soviet Union, then the United States, rapidly bypassed the individual countries in Europe. And that created a new constellation in which European countries found that they had to band together. Individually, Great Britain, France, Germany were no longer a match in economic and population power for global superpowers, but together they realized they could, and thus efforts to build first a European trading partnership, and then eventually a political union were born. And today, as we heard in one of the morning panels, the European Union can style itself the largest single economy in the world. Now you can argue about whether it's a single economy or not, the British especially want to argue against this. The French, Germans, maybe not so much. But certainly, if one treats the Euro monetary zone as a single, more or less unified economic unit, uh, it is uh, the largest uh, single economy in the world. Uh, but United States close behind, then China. So in terms of all these emerging markets and shifts in global inequality and population, we're now in the midst of another shift, a shift in which the Chinas, Brazils, Turkeys, Indonesia are rapidly moving up, and the Western developed countries, Japan, Japan, uh, European individual countries, and Russia are slowing down and are going to be left behind. Now, in a sense, it's good to say, well, the world is becoming more equal with uh, across countries. It's no longer the case that a small number of imperialist Western countries are dominating the world. Uh, we're still living with some of the consequences of that in a very negative way. But it does create great socio-political risk because in a world where emerging rising powers are jostling for recognition and and a greater role in the world, um, there's always been a great risk of conflict between rising and declining powers. Now, the best way to avoid that risk is by extending collaboration and treaty agreements. Uh, the best way to magnify and increase those risks is by building competing power blocks. Which direction are we going in today? Well, it would be great if the European Union continued to expand, if NATO's expansion was not problematic, and if China was not seeking to dominate uh, ASEAN and other Asian groups. That's the direction of competitive blocks, and that seems to be the direction we're going. Again, one of the paradoxes raised in the morning sessions was that even as the world grows more globally intertwined, nations are becoming more nationalist in their policies. And I would argue that even as inequality between nations grows less, we're seeing a resurgence of nationalist antagonisms and an effort by nations to hold on to or build blocks of geographic influence. So in my view, this is quite destructive. Uh, the preference would be for Russia to do what 
Great Britain, France, and Germany did and recognized that Russia can be an extremely powerful nation as part of a broader European coalition, but will have great trouble being a powerful nation acting on its own. China can have all the trouble it wants by trying to be aggressive and demanding a sphere of influence for itself in the Western Pacific, or it can continue to grow its economy by broadening its integration and improving its relations across the Pacific uh, with the United States, Latin America, and Europe. So I uh, would prefer to be optimistic, but I have to say you know, the trends in global inequality economically look good, but politically people seem to be responding in a dangerous manner. And I hope that we neither get a political crash nor an economic crash, but I agree with Avner, we seem to be saying we'll let the problems develop and let them emerge later. Today we will try and maximize our short-term interests. That, that's never been the best way to proceed, so we have to see if we can shake ourselves away from that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jack. Uh, that was exciting. I hope there are, will be questions um, just a bit later. We can make time. Um, not only did 11.52 minutes, that was really something. <laughs> Our next speaker, Branko Milanovic. Uh, this is the second year I encouraged him to come, and he finally did show up. Um, he, a, uh, he's the Presidential Fellow of City University of New York, a senior scholar also for the Luxembourg Income Study Center uh, lead economist, research department of the World Bank through 2013. Uh, Bronco has written uh, uh, many major <coughs> works, including one which includes uh, some discussion of Anna Karenina. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in his 2005 book, um, he defined inequality, the inequality <coughs> possibility frontier in a 2006 paper on inequality. Um, he, he did joint work that uh, expanded that to 29 pre-industrial economies. And in his new book to be published in April, he talks about global inequality, a new approach for the age of globalization. And 12 minutes won't do just, justice uh, to his talk, but he will be presenting a paper at the end of, of today's session if you look in your uh, program. Thanks, Marco. Well, thank you very much, Carol. So, uh, as Carol said, actually, I'm going to be very brief on the part that I'm going to present this afternoon, later this afternoon. And unlike Avner, I don't have slides. Not that I don't have them. I actually have a surplus of slides, but I will present them <laughs> at 6 o'clock uh, in my talk on global inequality. Now, it is actually very uh, f uh, somewhat fortuitous that actually I'm speaking after Avner and uh, Jack and I. They covered, actually, if you look at this, Avner talked really about the inequality and the crisis within nations, mostly developed nations, but, you know, within nations. And Jack spoke about <clears throat> the, ch the global change, which is essentially driven by the differential growth rates between different countries and that rebalancing between Europe and Asia. But when you put these two things together, <clears throat> what you get is that actually, as I will show this afternoon also, what you get is actually the picture of global inequality. Because global inequality is essentially composed of two components. It is composed of components of inequalities within nations, and the second component is inequality of mean incomes between the nations. Now, the first inequality is the one that we all relate very easily to. You know, you say, what was inequality in Russia 20 years ago, or today, or what will be tomorrow? <clears throat> and that's kind of a very natural question that people ask. Well, the second inequality is inequality in mean incomes. And there we ask questions like, how much is Spain richer than Morocco? How much is the US richer on per capita basis than Mexico? Now, that second, que the que uh, second question is a v politically very potent question, as actually Jack explained, for many political reasons. But one of them is also migration. Now, one of the objectives of my book, and actually previous <coughs> writing, <coughs> excuse me, is to, to actually realize that the problem of migration is really a problem which is uh, sort of, I, you know, idea, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, structure set up within the framework of global inequality. If people migrate 
from poorer countries to richer countries, they migrate because they, increase their, they can increase their income by three or five times. I'm not saying that every migration is motivated by that. You have refugees, you have people who migrate because they like nicer weather in Spain rather than, you know, fog in, in uh, uh, England or snow in Russia. But the bulk of migration is economic migration. And that migration is really essentially a reflection of differences in country incomes. Now, when we go to these two, actually, components, <coughs> I would um, not speak today very much about <coughs> the first component, which is the, the component of within national inequalities. Actually, Avner spoke about, of course, absolutely, uh, I think, crucial or uh, work by, by Piketty that he did in, in, his, most, in, in his most recent book. Uh, and I would just like to say that in my forthcoming book that Carol very kindly mentioned, I have, a, obviously, a whole chapter on within national inequality. There, I propose what I call the Kuznets cycles. Uh, for those who don't know, actually, the, the, the essential theory in sort of inequality was based around the idea that Simon Kuznets, who is actually a Russian-American economist, had in 1955. It's a very old idea, but you know we have not been able to invent something brilliant since, uh, is that actually you have an increase in inequality as you become richer, because essentially people move from agriculture to industry, or they move from rural areas to urban areas, so you have actually rising inequality. That inequality peaks and then starts declining under different, uh, driven by different forces. First, because you have actually had a transition from agriculture to industry. Then you have aging of the population that demands higher transfers. And you actually then uh, uh, have democratization, which can be an additional force, have introduction of more progressive taxation, and then you have a reduction in inequality. Now, Piketty, what is very interesting, and of course that goes back to his original work from 1998, Piketty methodologically followed Kuznets very closely, because Kuznets was the first one to use fiscal data, US fiscal data, to study inequality. But he also very em emphatically rejected Kuznets' curve because he thought that the experience of West European countries and, and the United States in the 20th century was not characterized, as you can see, by an inverted U curve, which actually would be driven, you would go up and then reach the peak and go down, but rather, as you see in Piketty's graph, and one of them showed uh, by Avner before, it was actually the U-shaped curve, because in Piketty's world, you start with very high inequality at the time before World War I, you have then event of World War I, which actually I discussed in my book as endogenously driven, but I will skip that in a, for a moment. And then you have a decline of inequality in the 70s and the 80s, and then an increase. So basically, you have the struggle of the two U's. One is Kuznets' U, which was actually an inverted U shape, which Piketty also criticizes for being too optimistic or maybe used during the Cold War as essentially an instrument to tell poorer countries that they can actually grow their way out of inequality. And then you have the other uh, U-shaped curve that Piketty has popularized and argued in favor. Now, in my book, in that chapter that deals with national inequalities, I take a very different, somewhat different view. I actually argue that we are now witnessing the, within the, the modern era, that we are witnessing the second Kuznets uh, uh, curve, which then leads you to, the, to viewing Kuznets cycles as being driven by technological revolutions. In other words, to, very, to simplify things, you have technological revolution, which was the, the, the first industrial revolution. You had that force pushing inequality up to a certain peak. Then there are other forces, some of which I already mentioned. For example, on top of that, you have education that becomes more evenly spread, so that reduces wage gaps between those who are very well paid and those who are less well paid, less well, less skilled and less well paid. And then you reach that peak. After that, you have a decline, as basically Kuznets expected. But Kuznets did not live long enough to have seen that second curve appearing. And of course, we now see it from end of the 1970s, early 1980s, we see in the rich world that curve sort of sh uh, increasing again, which of course, as I said before, leads me to actually redefine the Kuznets hypothesis as a hypothesis of Kuznets cycles. And actually, I look backwards also 
for the, because there are lots of empirical work which has recently become available for the period in Europe, like 16th, 17th, 18th century. And essentially you find also Kuznet cycles, which in those days are actually basically Malthusian cycles. Because the Kuznet cycles with in, in economies where you don't have sustained increase in mean income are simply the cycles around the same mean, but they are driven by forces of war or for, very often actually by forces like uh, plague or general epidemics. Now, what that happens there is that you have reduction of population, you have increase in wages because labor becomes relatively scarce, so you do have actually decline of inequality. And then the Malthusian forces kick in, you have increase in population, reduction of wages, and then an increase in inequality. So basically, if I were to simplify, you would have <coughs> Kuznet cycles in the, during the pre Modern, during the pre-industrial revolution times or pre-modern times, which would be Kuznet cycles around more or less unchanged mean income. And then since, depending on what country, but essentially since mid 19th century, you would have two Kuznet cycles around increasing income. But forces of course now would be quite different. And the last point on that, I just want to mention that <clears throat> I distinguish between benign and malign forces. The benign forces were the forces that essentially Kuznets had in mind. And these are the forces of equalization of education, the forces of increased taxation, the forces of uh, uh, end of movement of labor from agriculture to manufacturing. And nowadays, of course, the opposite force is actually movement from, from the industrial sector into services, which are much more heterogeneous in terms of uh, labor skills and which also don't allow you to have, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, trade union organizations of the type that you had in the past. But then I also look at malign forces. Now the malign forces are the ones that I mentioned before, wars and uh, epidemics. Civil strife is another one. And in that context, and I will not as I said, expand too much on that, I actually would regard the World War I as essentially uh, an endogenous event which happened because of high inequalities which existed in the belligerent countries. And go, I go back to, of course, old theory which was, of course, back, goes back to Rosa Luxemburg and Bukharin and, and Lenin and Hilferding, which actually view, views endogenously the competition of imperialist countries for new territories of having led to the World War I, but being driven in turn by the, by the internal conditions in those countries. So as you can see there, then the, the crucial event of World War I, which in Piketty's view is, in, is, is an exogenous event, becomes basically endogenized in the conditions of the pre 1914 uh, Europe and world, and the world. <clears throat> now, that last point, I think, has very important implications for what Jack was saying before, because we, in some sense, see relatively similar constellation of forces today that we have had 100 years ago. So the question then becomes, are there certain forces which are internal forces in the countries which would lead them to a path which could actually sort of end up in some form of a catastrophe for the world as a whole. So I think this is an issue, obviously I'm not going to resolve that problem, I'm not going to make predictions, but I think that actually we see certain forces among which rising inequality within nations and this rebalancing of the world, which means differences in incomes between nations being resembling something which happened, as I said, 100 years ago. My last point on between, because actually this reformulation of the Kuznets hypothesis took me more than I originally expected, I just want to say on the between part that actually, as was said before but Jack, indeed we have lower inequality between countries now than we had you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So that's actually the good news. However, that inequality is, of course, still extremely uh, high, and if you break the global inequality, as I will show this afternoon, if you break global inequality into these two parts, the between inequality is still the dominant component. However, it could be that in 50 years, if China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Nigeria, Ethiopia continue with high growth rates, 
that, that between inequality will dramatically shrink. And in that case, if, of course, the world survives in 50 years hence, we will be in the similar situation that the world was in 1820. Because in 1820, when we have actually first estimates of global inequality, the dominant component of global inequality was within national component and not a between. So you can imagine the world where actually China and Russia and the US and India would have similar incomes. Let's suppose like the countries of the European Union have it today, but that inequalities within the nations would have increased. So then when you uh, sort of decompose global inequality, the bulk of inequality would be within national inequality. And that's an interesting situation, and I will end on that, we, because it leads us to a following sort of historical moment is that essentially by mid 19th century, where the socialist movement started, and of course when Marx wrote uh, Das Kapital, the dominant inequalities with, were within national inequalities. We have then gone for 100 years to a different world where the dominant inequalities were between national inequalities. So it, the question now to be asked is, are we in the next you know, uh, 50 to 100 years are going to go back to a pre uh, 1820 world where actually the, the bulk of inequality would be within national, so you would have top 1% and rich people within the countries and poor people within the countries, but these poor people within the countries would have relatively similar incomes between themselves. Obviously, this would not be at the subsistence level as it was in 1820, but it may nevertheless be an important component that would introduce also global in instability. So this, this way you have had actually, I think basically in conclusion, it seems, although we did not plan it that way, three speakers with very pessimistic endings in their stories. Thank you very much. Thanks a great deal. I think that's true and you also raised questions that are cross, cross speakers and I hope we have time to. I, I, I'm gonna have, we have so many speakers. I hope you will allow me to continue until the end um, for questions. Do you think I should? Yeah, well, maybe just one question. Hello, sir, sir. Yes, one question, but very, very brief. Oh, uh, thirteen. My name is uh, Professor Landau Svangul. I represent Russian uh, uh, University by Plehanov. And the question is uh, for the previous speaker. Uh, he's telling us that Bukharin and Levin, they foresaw on the eve of uh, these dangerous events uh, followed by the revolution, this inequality which led to global disproportions at the level of development which led to a global collapse. And here the problem lies in the following, that neither Bukhari nor Lenin, they couldn't predict that, and it is quite obvious. That was uh, probably foreseen by Plekhanov in 1886 in his work Policy and Power. By intuition, he, uh, he, he said, I'm about to finish. Uh, and that was prediction in that work. I cannot agree with the professor that the development and the gap um, in development is shrinking. I believe this disproportion is increasing. And we are living in the epoch of globalization of the indifferent people. As uh, our ideologists, they say, and the extra, we live in the epoch of globalization of indifferent people. And now uh, we uh, are facing the globalization of aggressive people. And this dis, uh, dis uh, and again, the uh, shrinking of this disproportion can lead to uh, aggressive situation. Uh. Questions addressed to Bronco should probably be uh, reserved for his paper because we have very little time at this session. Um, would you like to answer? No, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, well, I would wait late, actually. Uh, 
Um, we are now, one of our participants will have to leave early, and so we'd like to know if uh, Lilia Charova might uh, speak now, if we can shift to the Russian uh, part. Uh, let me please introduce Lilia, who is a director of the Institute for Social Development Studies at Higher School of Economics. Lilia is the leading expert in the field of poverty and inequality. She is a contributor to the National Human Development Report in the Russian Federation 2000 for United Nations Devel Development Program. Lilia has excellent publications in the peer-reviewed journals, for instance, the urban-rural divide in the perception of the poverty line, the case of Russia, which was published in Applied Economics Letters. And today, Lilia will be talking about the determinants of income inequality in Russia. Можно поставить мою презентацию, но добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Good afternoon, esteemed colleagues. And first of all, I'd like in the first line of my presentation, I would like to thank Carol uh, for inviting the uh, most leading specialists on equality in the world. And uh, uh, the Piketty uh, presence and uh, reference is very important here. I'm not going to torture you with my slides, but I would like to comment on two of them and how much time do I have not to infringe the agenda. 12 minutes. So I'd like to mention the following, that uh, Russia is attributed to the countries uh, of very high inequality, and there's always uh, a question how to measure this inequality. Uh, the same uh, question I have to Jack, as we uh, it was said that the uh, medium class is increasing and becomes larger, and whom do we consider? consider the middle class and uh, just uh, by selecting the measure it may uh, make our perception of the middle class different so the problems of poverty were the most important uh, problems for the discussion of sources of social tension and now speaking about poverty in Russia uh, now this discussion is shifting to the side of inequality, and this is quite uh, understandable because in the period of economic crisis, the question about the inequality, why this inequality is, does not uh, become a driver of economic uh, growth. So people understand, in order to ensure the economic growth, uh, people need certain kind of inequality, which is later transformed into investments, and new uh, work or jobs would transfer into new income of population. And when uh, this stop, stops working, so the question arises why this kind of inequality exists. So by this slide, uh, I'd like to make uh, the announcement about the work of Swiss Credit Bank about the distribution of wealth. And before we spoke about the distribution of income, and uh, uh, Pickett is also telling about wealth uh, rather than uh, income. And uh, here we could uh, question the methodology which is used by Swiss, uh, by Credit Suisse in, in inequality in income. And my group, we tried to specify these characteristics which exist in Russia. And after that, the Gini coefficient on wealth was reduced a little bit. But we are still the leading countries in dynamics of wealth and Gini on income and wealth, Ukraine, 
is number one. Uh, Russia holds the second place, and you can see that uh, factors, uh, those who know the Gini coefficient, it comes closer to one. And uh, I wonder if we could speak about the link between inequality and social tension. Maybe Anne will tell us more about this. Uh, no, I understand. Okay. And uh, there is a work written by Mr. Gimpelson and uh, by the second author who say that real inequality and the attitude of the population to inequality, they do not exactly match each other. There is a subjective understanding of poverty. Uh, and subjective understanding is the two different realities. Uh, now let's look on Denmark. You see, uh, there's a low coefficient in income and uh, how big it is in wealth. And it doesn't mean whether it is high or low inequality. The matter is how this inequality is transformed into economic growth. When this inequality stops, being transferred into the growth, so the question arises, and that happens at the time of crisis. And that should somehow threaten the owners of this wealth. And we spoke about this, that when the situation is calm, such redistribution is not taking place. But when uh, it's, it becomes a turmoil, so it may happen. So the highest inequality inside the country, the quieter would be the problem which Branko mentioned between the groups or inside the groups, which is more potent. And in the countries with high inequality, they feel uh, more the internal inequality. And uh, in the low-income uh, countries, they feel this uh, inequality between the groups. In Russia, between inequality between the group is uh, very high. It means uh, the inequality between more or less similar groups. And I'd like to mention two factors here, the high inequality between the regions and definitely the structure of economics uh, would be the ground for that and the people are living in so depressed regions and the inequality between the region is quite substantial between doctors and teachers but this is not the worst between the inequality uh, between groups it's a corridor for growth you see that that inequality and you orient yourself to that inequality. The same driver for that would be education. It's a powerful factor, positive factor between intergroup inequality. And for Russia, the problem uh, is as follows. This uh, is much lower than in other countries. The same is true for, um, for uh, employment. And uh, while the these positive vectors starts working the threat as inequality as a source of social tension will, will grow. And I'd like to react also to the following things. I will omit the minor details concerning the middle class. I would like to express my standpoint on that. And the most important driver of this economic growth growth would be the middle class. And whom do we attribute to the middle class and how we identify these people? And uh, my opinion, the middle class are those layers of population who have the ability to make a choice in the framework of their consumer behavior. If their <coughs> amount of money uh, prevent them from making a choice, they could not be uh, treated as a middle class. And in Russia, we have 30% of population. 
although uh, we consider uh, approximately 15% of population, but between poor and middle class, there is a big group of people. It is proto-middle or proto-poor class, and the ability uh, of choice uh, emerges later. <laughs> <laughs> I was asked to be brief, and I was brief. Thanks very much. Um, uh, very, very complex, very interesting, raising new questions that, re that will require uh, some questions later. Um. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I jumped in. Yes. Uh, we're going back to, to, to general, but it's, it's not too far. Uh, we'll go back now to China, and we're lucky to have with us today a postdoctoral research associate uh, from Princeton University. Can Thanks. I, Zhao Cheng? Xiang Zhou. There you go, yeah. John Joe. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he's co-authored one of the major papers in recent years uh, on inequality in China. Um, mm. And can I just intrude here? The Bronco tells us that we can't, whenever we talk about inequality in China, we have, perhaps you'll tell us whether it's true. And we have to remember that 98% of the global reduction of poverty between <laughs> 1881 and 2005 was due to China. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's my honor to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to present some recent findings about income inequality in China, uh, partly from my own research. Mm. Specifically, I'm going to, I will try to address four questions. The first is how high in, is income inequality in today's China? And second is what are the main determinants of inequality in China? And third is why has inequality increased in recent years? And the second and third questions are distinct, but related, but due to time constraint, I'm going to just summarize the major findings in a few words. And finally, I will uh, talk about will high inequality necessarily lead to social and political instability in the future. So first, let's look at question one. How high is inequality in China now? This appears to be a simple fact that could be answered directly from government statistics. But unfortunately, this is not true for China. As many of you know, the government statistics are not always reliable for a lot of political and practical reasons. For instance, the government uh, rarely publishes any micro data that we could use to validate the macro level statistics that it usually releases. And in the case of income inequality, uh, the National Bureau of Statistics uh, stopped releasing the Gini coefficient uh, since the year of 2000 when the Gini coefficient reached 0 0.41. So for over a decade, we did not know anything about inequality in China. But at the end of 2012, there was a big media splash that was triggered by economists named Gan Li from the Texas A&M University who claimed that the Gini coefficient uh, of family income in China now reached an alarming level of 0.61, which would mean that China is now one of the most unequal countries in the world, on a par with, uh, for example, Colombia and South Africa. And the finding from Ganli is based on the, China, the data from China Household Finance Survey, which himself directed in 2011 in the Southwestern University of Finance and Economics in China. And data from that survey also indicate that the average family income in China is actually higher than that reported by the Chinese government. So this is good news. But the bad news is that income distribution is highly skewed. As you can see from the middle panel here, the share of total household income earned by the top 20% is much higher in China than in the United States, which is already the most unequal country in the developed world. So this highly skewed income distribution results in extreme inequality as expressed by the Gini coefficient. And a few, only one month later, the National Bureau of Statistics responded by releasing the Gini coefficients for a whole decade from 2003 to 2012. And you can see from 
according to the MBS, the income inequality did not increase at all during these years. Actually, it declined a little bit since 2008. So overall, the Gini coefficient hovered around the level of 0.67 to, point, uh, to point, uh, 47 to 0.48. So it's much lower than the estimate, estimate reported by Ganli. So the question is, who is correct? Who has the right estimate? So to answer this question, we computed our own estimates of Gini coefficient from seven newly available nationally representative survey data sets, one of which is the, a large-scale inter-census survey led by the National Bureau of Statistics. But the other six are from independent university-affiliated uh, survey organizations. And for each of these surveys, we computed the Gini coefficient of family income among those families who reported a positive income during the previous calendar year. And here are the results. The black dots are Gini coefficients for earlier years assembled by the United Nations. And the red points are our estimates from the independent data sets. And the red line is a non-parametric curve that are fitted to those points which shows the overall trend of income inequality in China since the year of 1970. You can see since the year of 1980, around the time the economic reform started, income inequality has grown dramatically. And according to the smooth estimate of the curve, the Gini coefficient of family income it was about 0.55 in 2012, which is much higher than the government statistics, but, al but also much lower than the estimate reported by Gan Li. So our estimate uh, lie in the middle. And this chart shows China in a comparative perspective, which uh, here I compare China with the other four emerging economies, Brazil, India, South Africa, and Russia. And you can see among the five countries, China has the most dramatic growth in inequality during the past 35 years. So now China is much more unequal than India, Brazil and, the South, and uh, Russia, and very close to South Africa. So now let's move away a little bit from the abstract Gini coefficient and look at the more detailed picture of income distribution among Chinese families. So here is a bar plot showing the family income at different quantiles in 2005 and 2012. And the black line shows the income growth during the, se during the seven years at different quantiles. You can see during these years, family income has grown a lot for all quantiles. For instance, the median income has almost tripled during this period. But from the black line, you can see income growth was much smaller at the lower end. So this chart implies that the growth inequality during these years are mainly driven by the poor lagging behind rather than the rich leaping ahead. And in a related paper that I co-authored with my co-authors, we have shown that poverty rate in today's China is also higher than that reported by the Chinese government. So if we use the $1.5 per day, the poverty rate in China now is over 15%. So in terms of reduce, reducing poverty, China still has a long way to go. And I'm going to summarize uh, the first finding is China's inequality with uh, the Gini coefficient is now about 0.53 to 0.55. And I'm going to summarize the, the my la next two conclusions because I don't have time for that. So the first is that a substantial part of China's high inequality today is still due to collective factors such as regional differences and the rural-urban gap. But the recent rise of inequality is not due to that two, those two factors. Instead, the recent rise of urban inequality I have shown is mainly due to increasing returns to education and uh, structural changes in the labor force, which are mainly driven by changing educational distribution and changing sectoral composition, the declining share of state sector employment. Now let's move on to the last question. Will high inequality necessarily lead to social and political unrest? So to answer this question, we might consider what have been the major sources of legitimacy for the Chinese Communist Party since the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. First, before the 1978, before the economic reform started, the source of legitimacy was mainly from egalitarianism. 
at that time, as everyone was eating from the same big pot, there wasn't much unfairness to complain about, although everyone was poor. But since the economic reform started around 1978, income inequality has grown dramatically. There wasn't egalitarianism at all. And now, and, but during this reform period, the source of legitimacy has shifted to strong economic performance. But now, as the economy is gradually cooling down and inequality is likely to stay high, it has been argued that the only source of legitimacy for the party in the future can be meritocracy, which means equality of opportunity rather than equality of outcomes. And we have two ways of measuring meritocracy in China. The first is through the subjective attitudes, the perceived attitudes toward inequality among ordinary Chinese people. And the second is to use the actual degree of intergenerational social mobility. Now let's look at them one by one. Here is a chart showing results from a 2009 survey which asked a nationally representative sample of respondents as to why some people in China are poor. And you can see the top three perceived explanations are lack of ability, lack of effort, and low education. For instance, over 60% of Chinese think that lack of ability has a large or very large influence for wh why people in China are poor. And only 20% think that unfair economic system has a large influence. And similarly, if we ask respondents as to why people in China are rich, you have the same responses. The top three perceived explanations are ability and talent, hard work, and high education. So from these two charts, we can see that Chinese people are still highly tolerant of inequality. And they think that high inequality is a result of individual differences in ability and effort. So perceived meritocracy is quite high. Now let's look at the actual degree of meritocracy measured by intergenerational mobility. So here is a bar plot showing the so-called strength of status hierarchy, which is essentially a measure of the degree of association between fathers and sons in their occupational status. So the higher the association, the lower the mobility. We can see during recent cohorts, status hierarchy has gradually strengthened, which means that social mobility has declined. But if we compare China with mature capitalist countries in Western Europe and North America, such as England, France, and US, China's still quite fluid, which means that intergenerational mobility is quite high, at least until the most recent cohort. So this leads to my last conclusion, that is high inequality per se is unlikely to cause social and political unrest in China. First, because Chinese culture highly endorses merit-based inequality, and second, the actual degree of intergenerational mobility is still fairly high, at least until the cohort born in the 1970s. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That was stunning and interesting. I'm sure that we... Thanks. Thanks. Great deal. That was really stunningly interesting. I hope we can bring that into uh, discussion later. So we switch to the Russian. As our next speaker is Natalia Zubarevich, who is the director of the regional program of the Independent Institute for Social Policy. Natalia is a leading expert in a number of fields, such as social and economic development of Russia's regions, social and political geography. She is also an author of uh, monographs, including Social Development of Regions uh, of Russia, Problems and Trends in Transition, <coughs> Russia regions and the social space in which we live. And today, Natalia will be talking about interregional inequality in Russia. Please. Thank you for your invitation. I already participated in discussion when the problem of inequality, the regional inequality, was shown by the World Economic Forum. And now, in broader context, and I clearly say only in the, about inequality of the regions, not only in Russia, but in different countries. Inequality has a reason to discuss if the country is big. The such countries in the post-Soviet space are three, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. 
I'll try to talk briefly about those countries and the key word in the inequality of our countries will be rent and policy of the state. Let's see why the policy of the state is crucial. It can be different in countries with catching up development, what is accepted not just help, but release competitive advantages of regions in order to make sure that they grow faster, then the entire country grows faster. This is always increasing territorial inequality. In the developed countries are different, but in the European Union it is accepted to put at the paramount the policy of territorial equalization. That's important, that increases consensus, but the outcome of this policy in the European Union is very weak. I mean economical equalizing, social equalizing, there are more successes in different territories. What is post-Soviet countries? What does happen there? Mentally, we are from the Soviet Union, where equality was the foundation and the policy was the increase of national corners of the countries. The older people remember this statement. What's happening now? Then we start became the countries where inequality was growing dynamically, and then it happened that for all of this, there is impact of the oil rent. So let's look at the Russian Federation. All the calculations, we made Gini calculation, but may my colleague Sergei Safronov from Moscow State University, please. Look, Gini index, uh, the base indicators, the gross domestic product in regions. It was growing, but in the middle of 2000, everyone remembers when the price for oil soared and the country started to distribute more. It started shrinking. Then crisis and stagnation look how stable almost decreased, except for the crisis of 2009, inequality of revenue, more moderate decrease of territorial inequality in the salary. Even weaker is the poverty, because for this you need targeted policy, otherwise it doesn't work, and only one strange labor market where the impact is the weakest, the strict authoritarian regime behaved as it is supposed to be according to economical hypothesis. We distributed rent, we achieved on this path big success. The progress in economics and social equalization of territories, but not only in the labor market. Let's try to understand what type of equalization. I am bad mathematician, but I'll remember you that two types of convergence, beta and sigma. This was computed from the Gaidar Institute. Look, please, is it possible for Russia to determine what type of inequality of the softening of inequality prevents? Uh, dom dominate beta and sigma is sigma is narrowing of the distribution field. Here is there, here is this and that. We don't have clear trend, and mathematics shows this in general. And and, but there's no clear indication. Let's compare our country to the neighboring countries. The highest level of inter-regional inequality in terms of the gross domestic product, not in Russia but in Kazakhstan. Now, at first we were the same, because Russia equalized much more intensively, redistribution of money in the budget is now, there is always budget for health care, education and other public services. See how Kazakhstan behaved. It also started to decrease inequality. Rent helps when there's so much oil. Look at Ukraine. It goes according to what China does ahead and faster grow the regions with competitive advantages. There's no rent. Redistribution is much less. Let's look at the level of the labor market. Theory says that when there is economic growth, inequality of territories in terms of the unemployment rate should grow. During crisis it goes down, the next growth once again, sorry, it goes up again. And you see that at this point there is no clear growth or clear crisis. 
we are in stagnation. Similar but wicked picture is with Ukraine and only Kazakhstan where they clearly compute unemployment rate and they say it's 2 to 3 percent. We don't even look at it. Not interesting. It shows that they have nothing is happening at the labor market where normal country that reacts at all the changes. Let's look at the social indicators. These are the wages which was increased not to poor, only to poor budget workers, but also to the uh, officials in the big cities. And uh, this balance uh, couldn't mitigate this territorial imbalance. Let's look at Kazakhstan. This inequality in income is greater than on wages. And the most important here is the crisis. Inequality in income started to decrease. And the rent is uh, uh, also uh, lesser. And we are expecting the same situation in Ukraine. No, this is not a brilliant uh, policy. This is the change in methodology. And now, again, here is the growth uh, of in inequalities. It continues to be. There is no rent and uh, no leveling. And the rich regions, uh, there the income of the population grows better. And the rent changes dramatically the picture for the countries of post-Soviet development. And this is the last slide. Yes, the rent, uh, which uh, the growing uh, oil rent uh, helped us uh, to shift this inequality, especially in income of population here, the scope of redistribution was the maximum, and uh, Lydia uh, would uh, uh, prove it that one-fifth rubble, uh, this is redistribution, these are just different uh, subsidies to the population, social payments, including uh, pensions, and that worked both in Russia and in Kazakhstan. We've been uh, champions in leveling, and Kazakhstan uh, is uh, more cautious in this uh, process. So it means that uh, the cyclic nature uh, is seen here, and it is related with the policy and with the uh, with the raft, uh, rent, big oil or small oil. And for us, this is very viable, the price for oil. And uh, leveling started to grow, not immediately, but when the price reaches uh, fairly moderate and good level, and you feel the money in cash in hand, and politicians, they could spend it. Uh, and uh, let's uh, go further. And if the rent shrinks, so inequality in income and payment of territory will grow, and we immediately lose what we have achieved, but not quickly enough. Second, unemployment here, the uh, inequality will become uh, lesser for the regions they would lose jobs where they were many and diverse and in the depressed uh, regions. So nothing changes there for their uh, labor market is almost dead. And now what's going to happen? with economic inequality, my perception of a new uh, cycle, stagnation. Let's see for a, a year or two and we'll have a chance to check. But before the start of a new cycle of uh, economic growth, the territorial inequality will not grow. And finally, What's uh, going to be before 2020s? I believe that the regions of Russia and Kazakhstan will turn from convergence to divergence. And nothing will happen in Ukraine because they always had divergence. The less oil, more normal economy.
Thanks to that um, major uh, set of remarks. Uh, I thought, uh, Ivana, you going to say something? I, I think this is Thomas. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, would you like to ask? Ah, is it your turn now? I think so. Oh, is it Tom? Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Wait, let me introduce him. Um, well, in any case, let me uh, introduce Tom Remington, who is the Goodrich C. White Professor of Political Science at Emory University. He is also an associate of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University, and a senior researcher at the International Center for the Study of Institutions and Development at the Higher School of Economics, uh, where he is um, he comes annually and, and uh, regularly. Um, his books, uh, the reason I wanted especially to invite him to Ranyepa, his books in, um, include one major work, which uh, most of um, uh, people, who, English reading people read is the Politics of Inequality in Russia, published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Thanks very much, Carol, and thanks for inviting me to participate. Uh, I want to ask two questions. Uh, first, what's driving social policy in Russia and China? And second, what is the effect on inequality? So I'll try to be very brief. First, what do I mean by social policy? Uh, you're familiar with the concept of the old socialist social contract, uh, which in effect existed both in the Soviet Union and in China, which adopted it, a very comprehensive understanding of the relationship between social welfare and the planned economy labor as an input to the production process, labor therefore being protected uh, by the state. When we think of social policy, we never want to simplify it or reduce it. It has many dimensions. One is straightforward redistribution, um, consisting of transfer payments and other forms of redistribution. Uh, it can take the form of redistribution across income categories or as uh, Natalia just was talking about redistribution across regions. I want to talk about both dimensions of those. Uh, social policy also takes the form of social insurance, which is a common method of uh, organizing pensions and health care and unemployment and other forms of social policy. A third way of looking at social policy is as a developmental uh, force by raising the productivity of human capital. We can ask of any given set of social policies in a state, is it widening inequality, is it reducing inequality? And I want to talk about that in the context of Russia and China and specifically address it through the prism of pensions. So one of the questions that I ask as a political scientist is, how does social policy get made, particularly in countries that don't do it through party competition or corporatist bargaining? And the best models that we have for policy making in social policy as in other domains are bureaucratic politics models. Uh, this is particularly appropriate in the post-socialist world where we have highly articulated and differentiated state structures and a very weakly articulated set of social uh, organizations or civic organizations such as parties or interest groups. <coughs> So we have bureaucratic coalitions frequently taking the form of or acting as proxies for social forces. So you are familiar, of course, with the fate of the old socialist so social contract, uh, equally in, in uh, Russia as in China, where the end of guaranteed lifetime employment uh, and the marketization of such social assets as housing uh, completely reshaped the environment for social policy. Um, individuals now bear much of the risk associated with employment and even with uh, old age incomes. Uh, they bear much of the risk for uh, health and unemployment and disability and the like. Both Russia and China introduced social insurance systems for their pensions and their health care and unemployment and disability and maternity. 
Uh, and social insurance can be more or less redistributive, depending on what the contributions level is and what the benefits level is and the degree to which it is socially as opposed to individually born. In any case, you are familiar with those basic facts. I want to talk about the relationship between social policy and inequality in the context of Russia and China. So uh, let me uh, give you a couple of inequality slides. We've already seen some of these. Shang showed us some, some wonderful data. Uh, the officially reported figures for Russia and China and US suggest uh, a uh, generally increasing trend. Uh, Shang's figures are absolutely fascinating. Um, the Swiss wealth report was uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. If we look at the top 1% of wealth holders, this is only wealth in the Credit Suisse uh, wealth report, you see a, a remarkable concentration of wealth in the hands of the top 1% in Russia, 70%. Uh, you don't see that figure, that level of concentration anywhere in the world. Uh, it's higher than the concentration in China. Uh, it's higher than the concentration in the United States. Uh, you see a greater similarity in the disparity in wealth holding once you get to the top five and still more, top 10%. Um, uh, in addition to the figures that uh, Shangzhou showed us, uh, we have a number of estimates. The China Development Research Foundation reported 0.48 for 2007. We have very thorough um, authoritative figures by Li Sato and Sicular uh, based on the China household income surveys, but highly reconstructed. And they reach estimates of about 0.48 for 2007. Bo Xi Lai, the day before he was kicked out of power, uh, released an estimate for what it's worth. A pair of Hong Kong researchers indicated that the genie was somewhere above 50, uh, that uh, Southwest University of Finance and Economics that uh, Shang was alluding to, as he mentioned, came up with 0.61. And as, uh, as he mentioned, the National Bureau of Statistics responded quickly with their own estimates. The point of this slide is to show how widely estimates differ. Um, now. I want to talk about what I think is the difference between Russia and China that for me explains a great deal, and that is the degree to which the two administrative structures are centralized. Russia is far more centralized when it comes to social policy, notwithstanding the high degree of regionalization about which Natalia Zubarevich and others have written. China remains far more decentralized with respect to both economic and social policy, with few exceptions. Uh, and the fiscal centralization figures give us uh, one indication of that. Um, you'll see a rising share in the present period of the degree to which revenues are uh, taken by the center as opposed to uh, regional budgets. In China, uh, you see a declining share of total state revenue going to the center. And you see that the, uh, the gap between them is widening. This for me is a as a capsule summary of the fact that Russia is far more centralized with respect to the redistribution, collection and redistribution of fiscal and social revenues. So um, both countries have, I think, a uh, bureaucratic arena in which we have, uh, as they call it, the social block. We heard it represented uh, this morning on the social policy panel. And we have a financial or economic block, which we've also heard represented. It's interesting that the two countries uh, compete over social policy really in very much the same bureaucratic alignment. Um, but when it comes to pensions, this is particularly apparent. Russia's pension system is obviously highly centralized. China's highly decentralized, indeed fragmented. So I want to give you a couple of uh, illustrations of that point. Um, the China uh, pension system is growing in the number of contributors. The number of recipients is growing less quickly. Yeah. But they don't aggregate nationally. Pensions aren't pooled nationally. That's the bottom line of what I want to say and what I think is so important. Um, there are rising deficits at the province level in a number of provinces, a declining number, but the deficits are rising and they don't pool, often they don't pool across cities, uh, let alone across provinces. And that's unlikely to change anytime soon and that's leaving, leading to enormous discrepancies in the levels of pensions 
and the security of pensions across China's uh, provinces. Uh, a province with a huge number of young people like Guangdong, where all these migrant laborers have come in, has lots of contributors. The, the Dongbei, the northeastern provinces, Jilin, Heilongjiang, Liaoning, they have a lot of older people who are receiving and they don't have enough contributors. And you don't have a redistribution system across provinces. Uh, now, we heard uh, Alexei Kudrin this morning in the social policy panel talk about things he's talked about often, and that's the rising demographic crisis facing Russia, uh, uh, in which we have uh, an increasing degree of unsustainability of the current pension system. Um, what the figure is deceptive on is that, of course, they are balancing the pension fund deficit by taking the freezing the current or more the moratorium on the current contributions to the accumulative portion, the nakapitinaya chest of the pension system, and that is temporarily uh, helping to alleviate the crisis in the pension system. But the point is the pension system is highly redistributive, but it is not succeeding in overcoming the long-term deficit faced by the pension system in Russia. Now, what, what does this do for the alleviation of poverty among pensioners? In Russia, uh, pensioners are not disproportionately distributed among the poor. This is a set of figures from Yusei Gurevich and, and uh, Yekaterina uh, 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 Sonina, um, where we see that among all pensioners, about the same number of them are in the lowest quintile as the total population are. But we will also see from the second row that the system of pensions is not especially redistributive. And that's particularly true for the base portion. The bottom quintile of pensioners aren't getting more than 20% of base pension income. So it's not really much of a hedge against rising inequality in Russia. Um, now, we, we heard from Natalia Zubarevich, uh, who's authority, authoritative on this, the rising inequality across regions. That's the other big part of the inequality story for both countries, both Russia and China. In Russia, we're seeing even price-adjusted rising discrepancies. The box plots show you the interquartile spread. They're, that's what's colored. You see the median. So you actually see rising differentials across regions as time passes with respect to mean incomes. Um, the decile gap is also growing across regions. Um, what about China? The same trend, rising re interregional inequality in incomes and in output. Um, what I want to conclude with is what does this mean for state fiscal policy? It means an enormous amount of redistribution by the state to alleviate and this is the point that Natalia was just making as well, to alleviate some of the extremes of inequality. But if you look at the degree to which regional incomes, regional budgets in the two countries are subsidized by subsidies from the central government, in the poorest regions, at the high end in both countries, over 80 percent of the regional budget is formed by transfers from the central government and at the bottom end, less than 10% for the rich regions. That in both countries. So it's striking that in both countries, this tremendous interregional disparity in income and output is being offset to some degree by a tremendous amount of subsidization, which is cross-regional redistribution. A map in the two countries shows us how it works. For China, it's those eastern uh, coastal provinces that have the very high incomes and they are redistributing to the uh, inland provinces. Uh, and in Russia, a somewhat similar phenomenon. We have rich regions and we have um, oil rich regions in the central country, central of the country, con center of the country, contributing revenues that are redistributed to the poorest regions. So very high redistribution, but that is a way of avoiding redistributive social policy. So redistribution across regions alleviates the need for a highly uh, egalitarian fiscal and social policy, which would require, as I see it, a completely different social contract. 
So politically, we have a situation in both China and Russia, somewhat like the EU, somewhat like Germany, rich regions subsidizing poor ones as a way of avoiding having to centralize fiscal and social policy. Thank you very much. Let me just say thank huge thanks to both Natalia and Tom. These are, these are um, remarkably pushes forward our understanding of uh, what's going on right now. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, introduce Maria Kozakova, who is the head of the Laboratory for Economic Development Problems at Gaidar Institute for Economic Policy. Uh, Maria specializes in computable DGE models and has two papers which are so far uh, qualified as MBER working papers. And today, uh, Maria will be talking about an empirical study which links economic growth and income inequality. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ivan. Uh, in fact, uh, I won't uh, talk about computable uh, general equilibrium models now, so <laughs> it's more uh, cross-section uh, regression, so well. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I'd like to uh, tell uh, briefly about uh, the research we've done in our uh, department together with uh, Ivan and uh, other colleagues. Uh, briefly, we uh, wanted to test uh, the relationship between uh, inequality and growth, and. Uh, Actually, we were motivated by uh, two main uh, things. Uh, the first one is that uh, now Russia faces a uh, very high inequality level, and uh, um, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, very low rates of economic growth. Uh, uh, now I would say it's not growth, it's uh, uh, economic slowdown. And the uh, second thing is, is that uh, there are uh, several um, theoretical channels which link uh, inequality and growth and uh, are described in, uh, um, uh, in uh, literature. Uh, well, the next slide, please. And the next. <laughs> so, uh, as I have told, uh, uh, first we uh, try to test empirically the uh, general uh, relationship between inequality and growth, and then we try to uh, test uh, uh, theoretical mechanisms. Uh, the, these mechanisms are uh, described on this slide. Uh, it's uh, first imperfect financial markets, uh, fertility mechanism, and then uh, uh, redistribution and um, uh, political instability in social uh, conflicts. Uh, well, in our research, we followed strategy described in uh, Perotti's uh, work. It's the next slide. Uh, uh, in the first part of our work, we tested uh, um, uh, the baseline regression of um, growth and inequality and the list of control uh, variables. And in the second part, we uh, tested uh, uh, channels uh, of um, uh, relationship between growth and inequality. So we, we tested uh, two regressions and used the uh, um, uh, least squares and uh, two-stage least squares. Uh, the second slide. Uh, yeah, in our research we used uh, World Bank data uh, for 79 countries uh, from 1990 to uh, 2013. Uh, dependent and independent var variables are descri <coughs> described on this slide, so I won't uh, tell much about them because I don't have time. <laughs> the next slide. Uh, well, uh, the general result is that um, uh, in the baseline regression, all uh, uh, coefficient uh, estimates uh, uh, happen to be st statistically uh, significant and uh, have uh, expected uh, signs. Um, uh, that is, there is a strong negative relationship between uh, economic growth and in income inequality, and this results, uh, result holds for both indicators of income inequality, uh, um, it's Gini coefficient and uh, middle class income share in GDP. Then we performed uh, some robustness checks. 
the next slide. Uh, these are uh, adding uh, regional dummies, uh, then uh, poverty indication, indicator, um, the share of aged population, and finally, we tried to test uh, somehow uh, Kuznets uh, hypothesis and added uh, urban population share. Uh, well, uh, our relationship between uh, growth and in income inequality uh, happened to be uh, robust to all um, uh, tests, except regression with uh, regional dummies. And uh, uh, all inequality indicators became insignificant when we um, excluded uh, high inequality uh, countries and uh, uh, very poor countries, uh, that is, countries with the lowest uh, per, capita, per capita GDP. Uh, this um, may mean that uh, inequality uh, influences growth more in uh, poor countries. Well, uh, then we tested uh, the theoretical mechanism of link between inequality and growth, uh, but unfortunately, we did not succeed, and none of these channels uh, turned out to be sti statistically significant. Well, I switch to main results. Uh, as I have told, it uh, appears that there is a relationship between inequality uh, of income and economic growth. Um, we did not succeed of, with testing uh, theoretical channels. This uh, may be explained by two things. Um, maybe they are not uh, relevant for explaining this relationship. And the second one, you know, which is uh, more realistic to my mind, is that um, we just can't test them correctly due to uh, um, lack of statistical data or, and so on. And uh, so this may uh, remain uh, the direction of uh, fur uh, further research in this field. And um, uh, we also conclude that the main ways of uh, uh, increasing the rate of economic growth is uh, to uh, lower inequality through investments in um, human capital, that is, uh, investments in education and uh, health uh, system. And finally, uh, conclusions uh, for Russia are that uh, uh, one of uh, the main results of inequality in Russia is high poverty. Uh, well, uh, high poverty increases uh, the risk of uh, social, criminal, and uh, political uh, tension. Uh, it uh, reduces um, uh, investment, so it uh, induces a fly flight of investment uh, and economic slowdown. It also affects the most uh, uh, um, sensible uh, uh, population uh, share, uh, uh, that is, pensioners. And it also results in financial, educational, and health uh, disparities. So I'm concluding. Uh, possible policy recommendations uh, are the following. Uh, the first one is to um, uh, increase the retirement age and uh, continue pension reform. The second one, um, uh, institutional uh, reforms, uh, which uh, not only stimulate economic growth but also uh, reduce uh, the level of inequality. And uh, we think that redistribution policy should be only a transition measure, but not fundamental, me fundamental measure of uh, reducing inequality. That is all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Let me just say it sounds like a tremendously exciting project. Uh, thank you. And uh, our last speaker uh, is Anna Likianova, uh, a senior research fellow at the Center for Labor Market Studies at Higher School of Economics. She is an expert in, in labor market and inequality and has a number of excellent publications in peer-reviewed journals, such as Employment Protection Legislation in Russia, which is published in Comparative Economic Studies. And today, Anna is going to present uh, a study where income inequality is linked to shadow economy. Uh, uh,
Thank you for invitation to this discussion. Really, I don't have much time. And I believe that time, knowing that I will not be given so much time, I didn't prepare a full-grown presentation. I'd like to attract attention to one of the works published just recently in Economics of Transition periodical, and it is dedicated to the link between formal and informality and equality, despite of the fact that informality, word, and informal labor market oftentimes is in the context of discussion of Russian labor market and the market of other emerging economies and those who are growing. It's still in our discussion in no way was used. In true, in many traditional economic countries, there's strong inequality in the beginning of transitional period. And in 90s, there was publication of numerous articles dedicated to this topic, and majority of those as the reason of a growth of inequality in terms of the wages. First of all, they offered such reasons as the growth of the education output, growth of the output of working in the private sector, and the growth of the interregional inequality. And one must say that the topic of informality for a long time was not used in the context of discussion of the transitional economic countries' growth. In the middle 90s, new works appeared that showed that in the countries of transitional economy, they have positive uh, channel between level of inequality and the degree of the level of informal sector. In the 2000s, there were several empirical works related to the research, uh, first of all, in Balkan countries such as Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, where they showed that the growth of inequality really had strong influence, at least significant influence, on the growth of inequality. And one must say that in Russia till now no research was done despite, despite of the in discussion of informality in Russia is quite uh, vast and informal labor market discussion are quite popular. And this is not coincident because to some assessment up to 40% of Russian GDP is made by informal sector. The degree of employment of informal sector quite high but there is official estimate of the raw statistics and their assessment by independent researchers and I'd like to point at it independent researchers data in particular Hartmut Lehmann and Angelika Zaitseva considered different definitions of inequality because there are so many definitions of inequality, so variations of assessments of inequality is quite diverse. The assessment from 7 to 20 percent of the employees are in, in informal sector and for self-employed much higher, up to 70, between 40 and 70, or even above 70 percent. This all is really big sector of the Russian economy. It could really impact inequality. And we specifically look at this problem because there are theoretical works that link between themselves inequality and informality. In particular, they show that one of the channels on the way in inequality impacts the economic growth is informality, exactly, because in the formal sector there's less performance than in the formal sector. That's why higher in the country is share of informal sector, then less will be total growth rate of, of economics. In my work, I was uh, posing a question, more narrow question, how does informal system impact the salary rate? And some of the results gained surprised me myself very much, because in many discussions you can hear that the salary in informal sector substantially less than informal sector. And the works of my colleagues that assess this gap in salary, such as 20%, uh, minus against the formal sector. One must say that their work relates to very specific years, such as 2009, the year after the global recession, 
when informal sector was substantially stronger impacted by the crisis. So this 2009, the gap between salaries informal and informal employees was extending at the longer interval, at least from early 2000 till the end of 2000s. We see that this is not really so. Informal sector, in fact, in Russia is very heterogeneous. It includes at least four components. These are self-employed and those who work for the self-employed individuals informally employed by the for the formal sector that work for regular enterprises but don't have labor contract, don't have labor book, labor journal. The third and another big group of the employed are the people that work and answering our concept of informally employed these are temporary labor, people working not full day, and employees that have uh, accidental jobs. The only group that happened to be really with less salary throughout entire distribution scale, not only mid-salary, but this is the last group with irregular employment people. Early 2000, this group was more than half of all employed, of all employed in informal sector. But as long as economy was growing, structure of informality substantially alternated. By the way, towards the best, the share of informal sector didn't decrease. The arguments whether it grew or not, but it didn't go down. Inside of it, substantially increased number of those who have regular employment and less those who have irregular casual employment. And those who have regular empl employment have lesser salaries than the employees of the formal sector. It uh, shrank, and the hourly rates are not so much different between informal and formal employees, but distribution of labor time is strongly different. Many those who work not full day and uh, work for short period, and this lack of employment expressed in hours is the reason behind that these people have lesser salaries. Uh, research in general says at the monetary level of salary, informal employees, at least in Russia, and I'm convinced in many other countries such as Kazakhstan, perhaps partially in Ukraine, whether don't lose or they lose little. In early 2000s, some groups of those were even winning against employed by the informal sector. In the formal sector, in terms of the salary uh, level, but they lose in other respects, such as inequality, that we somehow didn't consider because we focused at inequality and richness. But despite of such questions, such as protected employment, available access available in affordable health care services affordable credit for improvement of housing condition for these parameters social inequality can be substantially stronger and informal workers can lose against the formal sector employees much more from the standpoint of the salary besides employees of informal sector practically don't have any stimulus to improve their human capital characteristics because people such as education or job experience, all these characteristics are credited and uh, create gain more informal sector. These characteristics in the informal sector are not practically used since I already said that salary is practically equal. Specifics of informal sector in Russia is that this sector is exclusively voluntarily. The theory that was developed back in the 70s and the theories of segmentation saying that a formal market, labor market, and there's informal labor market, and informal wanted to be 
parts of the formal labor market and they don't have enough available jobs. It's pretty much that in Russia it's not like this. The voluntarily agreeing employees that go to informal sector because they have higher salary and this component, the pecuniary component, is much more important rather than some social benefits. I was trying to be so spontaneous and I was a little bit disorganized. I hope that you became interested in this topic. Ivan? Um, as we unfortunately don't have time for questions, I have to... Or do we have time? Do you think we have five, ten more minutes for questions? I would think we might, if they'll forgive us. But if we reduce our break to 15, 10 minutes, I think no, we no. can... A uh, question. I wanted to ask a question concerning on things which we heard. I am economist Balashev Alexey. I wanted to ask uh, a question to Mr. Offer. He mentioned the Bretton Woods system, and I'd like to remind that in 1970s, when the USSR was on the peak of its uh, power. Uh, 1% of the ruling uh, class possessed 20% uh, of the wealth, and uh, now the picture is different. 1% is concentrating uh, major wealth, and I understand that Bretton Woods financial system, which was structured in 1944, uh, and the essence of the Bretton Woods system is the expansion of the dollar zone, and uh, thanks to that, uh, system, you can uh, generate profit and you can print dollars. And through this redistribution, uh, the United States controlled the global uh, elite. And then uh, Reaganomics uh, took over, etc., etc. Today, we see there is a downfall of financial assets uh, globally, but the liabilities will not uh, disappear. And uh, we see lots of bank. Uh, bankruptcies and the question is as follows is there a possibility to reform Bretton Woods financial system which became the foundation for structuring of today's financial system as a dominance of uh, uh, inequality uh, actually uh, Mr. Struskan suffered uh, the attack and perhaps there will be another uh, attack but without a, a nurse in the room. Yeah, I uh, wanted to ask a question of uh, Professor Remington, who uh, I appreciated your, your uh, presentation very much. It was very interesting. Uh, at the very end, there was uh, one, uh, one comment that uh, took me back, and that was that the uh, distribution system of Russia, which focuses more on aid to the regional governments as opposed to individuals, uh, was sufficient to deal with the inequality, uh, or at least was uh, equivalent. As an economist, we always think of uh, using the mechanism which works at the relevant margin, which in this case would be direct income payments to people, would be, we think of as much more efficient. So is there any evidence that uh, this is an equivalent mechanism in terms of efficiency, how much is lost <coughs> relative to the preferred uh, theoretical mechanism? Can we have an answer? And then have, I think every one of these um, well for me the significance of the Bretton Woods system was that it forced countries to uh, regulate credit in order to support the fixed exchange rates. Uh, I also said that if we want to avoid the escalating 
household debt, which is associated with housing, we need to find a way to once again uh, regulate the amount of credit available. Whether that requires going all the way to restore the Bretton Woods system, I'm not sure. I hope there would be simpler ways of doing that. That's all I have to say. Natalia, would you like to respond to the question? I want the marshal to. Other questions? Yes, there's a question there, in the back row. I'm middle row. <laughs> I think that you have to I, no one wanted to answer your question. No, no, no. It was, no. Oh, it was, yeah, the question was no, Tom. No, I'm no. sorry. Sorry. Let, let, can you wait for just a second while Tom addresses this issue? Thank you for the question. Uh, obviously, a system uh, whereby transfers through the central government are uh, uh, meeting the needs of high deficit regions in both countries is an extremely inefficient way of equalizing opportunities or incomes. Um, what I suggested was uh, political institutions that would enable a different social contract uh, and therefore make social policy in general both more redistributive and more productively oriented would be vastly more efficient. What many of the Russian scholars who deal with social policy are saying is Russian social policy, and the same applies to China, is not redistributive. It is mildly redistributive, and many aspects of it are, in fact, anti-redistributive. So what we see with this cross heavy cross-regional subsidization of poor regions in both countries is exactly as Natalia Zubarevich put it, it smichayed, it softens, it reduces what would be an even more egregious tendency away from convergence. We are not seeing convergence according to the Barrow's you know, theory of neoclassical economic convergence. It is not happening in either country. So we are staving off what would be a worse degree of regional differentiation, I think. So, okay, yeah. Okay, question, please. I have, I have another question, maybe more comment. Uh, so we, we are talking today about inequality, and I think that inequality of revenues and is not uh, an economic problem. Different uh, speakers uh, differentiated different types of inequality, right? Inequality and uh, inequality on wealth and inequality of revenues, inequalities and perception of inequality. But still, all the time is inequality of revenue. And uh, I think that since uh, all economic agents are different, with different uh, background, of different human capital, different ability, and the most important, uh, different utility function and different preferences between leisure and work. So inequality uh, of revenue in this situation is quite normal economic phenomenon and not a problem. And uh, in my opinion, what is a real problem is inequality of opportunities. And I was quite surprised that nobody was talking about this inequality of opportunities. This is an economic problem and not an equality of revenues. And the situation uh, when 1% of population uh, have 90% uh, uh, of all, it's, it's quite a normal situation because uh, it, it may be, it may be not, but it may be a normal situation if uh, the distribution of abilities and preferences is like this. And what is important is inequality of opportunities. And I think uh, when we're talking about inequality of revenues, this is the first topic that we have to have in mind. Thank you. I actually think Lilia of Charova did uh, mention that, but would someone like, for this group, like to call on that, Tom? I do, I do disagree with the uh, premise of the question. Um, Economists frequently speak, speak of the skill bias technological change theory as accounting for the rise in inequality in the past, say, four decades, five decades. That does not account for the accumulation of wealth and income in the top 1% in any one country or globally. It simply cannot account for this extraordinary concentration of wealth and income at the top. 
which in turn distorts the politics of the countries in which it occurs. We haven't talked sufficiently about political mechanisms, but we have now gone in the US, in Russia, in China, and in most countries way beyond the point where a little inequality is a useful incentive. Can I get it? Please. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, maybe I would actually have to answer a similar question at the end of my talk today. But this is, a, of course, very often the question that we get. Now, let me divide that into two parts. So in one part, which I think is sensible part, and another part, which I believe it's not. The part which is sensible is, of course, that inequality of opportunity is very important. We now have for the first time, and I will not go into that because there is no time, but we have empirical studies. That's very important because when you just talk about inequality of opportunity in general, everybody agrees with that. But we have really to have empirical studies, and we for the first time have them, and actually Jo mentioned that because the, the, inter the relationship between parents' and children's incomes or education is one indicator of that. So that's the sensible part, and I'm actually thinking that this area is going to grow. The part where I don't agree with you is a naive view that you know the fact that 90% of wealth in the hands of 1% of people can be explained by some kind of preferences for wealth or hard work or leisure that other people don't want to work and do anything. Actually, this absolutely, I think, uh, on commonsensical ground, doesn't hold. It doesn't hold actually on any other ground empirical. We know how wealth has been acquired, particularly in Russia, but in other countries as well. So it, was, it is really, a, uh, as I agree with Tom, it has now become a political problem in many countries. It has really percolated and affects political process. And these people who are rich write the rules which are in favor of them becoming even richer. So it's not a small issue. <laughs> Let me. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. I also, uh, this this is a provocative question, so it, it draws a lot of responses. <laughs> but uh, at the bottom of your question, I think is the assumption that the market left on its own uh, allocates revenue, as you call it, re allocates income according to marginal productivity. That's one assumption. The second assumption is that this is a just ethical allocation. I think both of the assumptions are uh, deeply problematic. Uh, the assumption about the economy allocating revenue according to marginal productivity depends on assumptions, the most fundamental of which is perfect competition, uh, whereas in fact, uh, there's an enormous amount of market power of non-competition in the economy, so you cannot regard uh, income distribution even as economically efficient. As for the justice of the matter, if you look at what transfers are about, another assumption is that everyone actually has something to sell. But actually most of the transfers uh, carried out by the welfare system are from <coughs> producers to dependents to people who don't have anything to sell. Uh, and that aspect is not even taken into account in standard economic theory. Thank you very much. I would like to conclude. Uh, dear experts, uh, dear Keller and dear, dear audience, thank you very much for uh, this exciting discussion. Uh, uh, this afternoon we were awarded with a rare opportunity to listen to uh, the leading experts in the field of income inequality and poverty. Our experts covered a large variety of topics from income inequality within a particular economy such as China and Russia to uh, inequality, inequality issues related to the global level. Thomas Piketty and Angus Deaton popularized this topic in their bestsellers, Capital in the 21st Century and The Great Escape. And we know that Branko's book uh, on global income inequality will be published soon, so we expect to have another nice read this year. After decades of having a status of provincial research topics, the popularity of income inequality as a research field is finally on the rise. And 
since income inequality is uh, getting more and more popular, we might expect that uh, in the coming year we will be able to see uh, a new series of intriguing studies and insightful results. So our next year's meeting has a solid chance to become as illuminating as the current one. Let me close this panel. Thank you once again, and I wish you all the best. Thank you.